Happy Monday, folks. Welcome back to the podcast daily. I'm Bill Landis, and that's Doug Lay Maurice. That is not Jeremy Birmingham. This is not the normal oh. Monday daily that you get from us here on the podcast where Berm and I kind of rewatch the game and go through some of our thoughts. We might do that later in the week, but Doug and I were doing the post game show. We had so many good texter questions, and we got to like none of them, Doug. So we wanted to use the Monday daily. Uh, to change things up a little bit and make sure that we are involving the texters and get some of their questions and thoughts and comments into this show. So that's what this is. We're making it up to the people who we did not get to on the post game live show. I like to imagine the people who tuned in on a Monday expecting the normal thing and thought to themselves, oh my God, what happened to Berm? <laughs> so, but the reason like we'd like to do this kind of thing, Landis, is because like the texters are a great focus group. And like we're, you know, we're getting to that point where political polls are out again. And this is such a great focus group that even if you're not a texter, if you listen to the podcast, like I think Ohio State fans like to know what other Ohio State fans think. So we have questions from them. We have survey stuff from them. And I think it's valuable because it's educated, dedicated, loyal fans. It's not trolls. Um, it's it's real fans, just like the people listening to this, which is why it's worth doing this. Yeah, I love it. I like especially the the um, what's what's the word you use for it? Not test audience. What is what is the word? What focus is the word group. I'm looking for? Focus, focus group. group. Thank you. Yeah. The focus group nature of of the texting service i really enjoy because you you can use twitter right but it's hard and there's a lot of loud noises and you don't know what's real and what's not um i think you know we trusted everyone who takes the time and spends their money to join us via the texts uh, you know are real people expressing their real opinions and not just you know looking to tick people off so i appreciate that okay so we're going to run through some stuff and one of the things that happens on the text just like in real life is that people go through uh, a complete emotional cycle during the course of a football game. Everybody mm -hmm. knows that, but we can see the texts individually, but you can also see the string of texts that an individual subscriber sends. So before we get to questions, I just, I captured a couple of those because they're so interesting. And one of the people that I was like this, I sent a message back to them. It was like, this is great. And they were like, uh, I had a few too many. Sorry about that. I was like, don't be sorry. <laughs> so I'm just going to read the progression from sort of like, I think it's maybe like end of the third quarter to the end of the game. And I'm actually not going to read everything because some of the things are not fit to be aired. Okay, here we go. Individual text. Urban Meyer would be spitting acid by now. I'm on record for a new Ohio State coach. If they win, it's because of the other team. Day's entire legacy. Mr. Offense never has any when it matters. Mr. Genius looks like a dumb blank at every opportunity he gets. No one can rationalize the horrible coaches Day has put around him. It gets worse. I, I can't actually read. I have another one. The next one I have, I can't, I can't read on there. How is Mr. Genius offensive God not doing an Eagles quarterback sneak? I'll tell you why. He's soft. Team is soft. Players he picks are soft. Run to soft program. Urban can't be in a room that soft. Trestle sends regrets to his soft BS. Nevertheless, dude is soft, so soft, so soft. I will never contribute to Ohio State with this soft head coach. Soft, 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 soft. All of you are frauds. If you ever say Day is an offensive forward thinker, genius trailblazer, get out of here. I'll drop your service for being inauthentic. This dude stinks worse than Cooper. Day has never had a good team without Urban's influence. Fact. Prove it wrong. Urban would be up 20 to 10. Urban would be up at least 1614. <laughs> Urban would be up. Bring in some lackluster, no name guy who thinks receivers are better than offensive linemen. You get served, and Day is totally served. I take back all doubts about Ryan Day. <laughs> he is the best Buckeye blood coach for calling out Lou Holtz. I never have a bad word for him. I'm ashamed of my emotion. Kyle, the mailman McCord, dude delivers. Please delete my number. I'd like a refresh for day. That dude is Woody 2026. Unbelievable. <laughs> oh, like fantastic. Performance art, isn't yeah. it? So yeah. that's not what this entire podcast is going to be, but it could be. <laughs> but it could be because, you know, and I've said this before, the tech service I was part of before, after the mission game last year, it was just F, 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 F. Half the F words were fire and half the F words were the other F words. So the complete gamut of emotions that Ohio State fans went through, I will say, Landis, I asked this question. 
Uh, let's see. It's about whether you thought they were going to win or not. When Ohio State took over, down four at its own 35 with 126 left and one timeout, what did you think would happen? I thought Ohio State would lose 57%. I thought Ohio State would win 32%. I knew Ohio State would lose 9%. I knew Ohio State would win 2%. So overall, it's 66-34, lose versus win which is why you get to this point because, you know, to recap, there were some reasons to think that they were going to march down for the winning touchdown, but there were also plenty of reasons to think they weren't. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I I think it was hard to, one, know how Kyle McCord was going to react in that situation, and then two, figure out what exactly Ryan Day was going to try to do. And the answer was like, line up, spread them out, and bomb the thing down the field until you get to the one-yard line, which is exactly what everybody wanted to see them do. But they hadn't quite done that in in the game up until that point. So I I get that range of emotions. Um, It's funny, like, I don't don't have a dog in the fight, Rick. It doesn't. I wasn't really concerned with whether or not Ohio State won or lost. I just want to make sure I had all the information I had so when we went live, I could talk about it. but I kid, did kind of feel like once they got that first first down, like after the two kind of missed throws, I was like, oh, I, they might do this. Or at least they're going to get in a position to do it. Like whether or not they actually finish the drive is one thing. But I think they were going to give themselves – I thought they were going to give themselves a shot like once they got that first first down. So um, it would be interesting to be able to pull people in real time, like how how increasingly confident or, or not confident, I guess, they were getting as Ohio State got closer and closer to the end zone. Because I'm sure there were some people that were at their least confident when the ball was on the one-yard line. Yeah. So again, we're not going to do that entirely. I have a couple more, but there are questions and I did grab the questions sort of in order as they came in through the course of the game. This is where some people were at some point, Landis. This is our guy, Aaron. If this ends in Notre Dame's favor, is this Marvin's final game in an Ohio State jersey? Which is one of these things. It's Ari's fault. Ari's Mm -hmm. like, why would you go to college? Move to Malibu. Competition doesn't matter. Who cares about games? It's only about NFL draft prep. You should just come out of high school and go in a cryogenic chamber and lift weights and catch passes on your little gun. And why would you even play a game? Because (laughs) competition and fun and being with your teammates doesn't matter. So he started this, but Marv's hurt. He's highly valued. And if it feels like Ohio state season has blown up, that's where Ohio state fans were Landis. Would that, is that the kind of thing that should be crossing people's minds at all? when this game was in a bad spot? Uh, no. I mean, I, I get why it was, right? Because it's college football. Every loss feels like your season is over, but but like technically it wasn't. Um, but it's not, it's not just about the path, right? It's about it's about your confidence and their ability to rebound and, and then win the rest of their games to get there. So, you know, if they would have lost, then probably there would be very little hope that they would do that. So um, I don't I, – I would hope the people's default on the first loss is not jump right to best players should go to Malibu, but um, I understand why that was the case. All right, this is another one. It's it's not quite as long, and I'm going to skip a couple because, again, they can't be read on air. What's the point in supporting the team anymore if they are just going to keep getting pushed around and losing these biggest games? Time to shut the program down. <laughs> Kings of Columbus, kingdom that resi- resigns from Lane Avenue to Lennox Movie Theater. Bring on the 12-team playoff because they can't earn his way in without help. Football seasons aren't fun anymore when you don't win any trophies or rivalry games. Maryland is really going to get in two weeks to help get Ohio State back in. I don't know what that one means. No timeout called and you waste 40 seconds when you get the clock stoppage after two minutes. Saving it for a field goal. Swear word. I take it all back. Woo! So again, you get the point. Yeah. Th- this is a point. There are questions about play calling. Do you feel like there are legitimate questions about play calling that stand And our reasonable question on rewatch after a win as we move forward, because someone's saying here, my biggest frustration with the game, regardless of the outcomes that Ohio State seemed afraid to lean on their superior talent. Let your better players beat theirs, seem tight and conservative all game long. In that same vein, would it hurt to throw on third and short? How is this better than handing over play calling to Heartline? There were questions about this whole handing it over, not handing it over thing, but but where are you on play calling? The day after. Yeah. So I, I have now gone back and I've not rewatched the entirety of the game, but I did go back earlier on Sunday and I watched and charted um, every offensive snap leading up to the two minute drill, because obviously like once that starts, you're just throwing it around. So like I, I didn't 
I didn't want to use that as as an example of how they tried to go about their business until until that moment. Um, so I have a lot of thoughts on play calling. One, and, and this is probably my my overwhelming thought because there's a lot of talk about like conservative, not letting it rip, not aggressive enough. I actually partly disagree with that having rewatched everything. The very first play of the game, they tried to go over the top of the play action pass to like set the tone early. They they ran the the two man route combo, Marvin Harrison Jr. post, Julian Fleming uh hitch route off a hard play action and Notre Dame just like had it covered. Um and Ohio State tried to do that like six times and like every time Notre Dame had it covered. So and it was interesting because Ryan Day said something in his post game press conference about like this is paraphrasing, but something like along the lines of like looking at the concepts, because I think they were hoping to hit a couple of those, right? And and kind of flip that game and, and put the pressure on Notre Dame. And and literally none of them hit. The biggest play they had was the broken coverage play to Xavier Johnson. It was not for a lack of trying. It was um I don't know, perhaps the byproduct of Notre Dame like kind of picking up on tendencies, knowing what Ohio State was going to do and, and when they were going to try to do it, because they did a really good job of, of eliminating those. But I want to make the point that like they were trying to throw the ball aggressively, like from the jump. But the problem was when those plays didn't work, is what like what Ohio State's response to that was. And uh I have this written down here, so I'm looking at my notebook. Uh, I apologize for this. Uh they had 15 second downs in this game, and I sent this okay. text. Sunday. They had 15 second downs in this game. 12 of them were runs. Okay. They at the average yard to gain on second down was almost eight yards. They ran 12 times for an average of 3.1 yards per carry, which in itself I think is pretty damning. In and of itself is pretty damning. But this I thought was worse. So these shot plays, right? They called um, a shot play to uh, a mecca, I believe it was. It was like a. It was a like a slot fade off play action. That, yes, uh, a slot yeah. fade. Yep. Yep. Didn't hit it. Next play, false start. So the f- next step, first play after that, second and 15, they run for three yards. Um, they ran a play later, the off part play action. They're trying to get a tight end wheel, like an explosive play to Kate Stover. Doesn't hit Notre Dame, has it covered well. Next play, second and 10, run for two yards. Later, Emeka Ibuka drops the touchdown in the red zone. Really good, I thought, red zone pass design. It was like the one time they tried to rub route to get a guy open, and Emeka was opening to drop the touchdown pass, unfortunately. Next play, second and 10, run for two yards on a toss zone and then the short side of the field. Lastly, people uh, hate people hate tosses to the short side. Yeah. Play action pass to Marv after Marv was hurt. He came back into the game. The ball hit off his fingertips, and we're all thinking, like, man, if he was healthy, he probably would have caught that. Yep. Next play, second and 10, run for one yard. Um, they had six second downs with 10 or more yards to go. They ran all six times. That was okay. my, that's my, that's my biggest thing in this game. Like that's my biggest criticism of play calling in this game. Because they're trying to get from third and long to third and medium. Right. Yeah. But they're so intent on that. And then they're not successful at it. Right. That you're getting two yeah. and then you become predictable. six or seven. Right. Yeah. And then you become predictable because like, oh, it's second down. They're going to run the ball. So it's hard. I think they wound up. And I sent this to the texters. They want there's a Notre Dame analytics guy on Twitter that I follow that I think is good, and he was saying that, that Notre Dame was actually more efficient throwing the ball than Notre, than Ohio State was, but Ohio State threw it more. Mm-hmm. So as a result, because you know typically in that situation you you are going to be more efficient throwing the ball than you are running it. So the volume of passes made Ohio State a more efficient offense than Notre Dame overall. Ohio State in the end winds up with 42 dropbacks. And 23 run plays, which is like two to one. That's a pretty huge disparity. But it's about like 25 to six on the last two drives, which means before that, it's basically 50 50. So that's the thing that, and again, looking back to the Michigan game last year, they wind up throwing it a lot more than they run it in the Michigan game last year. But it's because they throw 20 of the final 23 plays up until that point it's kind of close to 50-50. So when when it's gut check time, when they're down, when they need it, and everybody does this, yep. then they throw incessantly. And then they, you know they wind up moving the ball a decent amount of the time. And then it's like, well, why didn't you do that before you got in that situation? So I think that conversation continues, and I don't think this game puts it to rest. It actually probably adds some some flame to the fire. Yeah, and it's not it's not like talking about it is not to take away from the win. It's just to 
have a discussion about something that feels important for when these games arise again. Like they're going to have one a month from now against Penn State, and they're going to have one a month after that against Michigan. The other ones probably don't rise to this level. Like they can yeah. probably get by doing basically whatever they want to do. Even the, even the game at Wisconsin doesn't look quite as as difficult as maybe some of us are making it out to be prior to the start of the season. But like these conversations matter, right? You want to you want to make sure that Ohio State is going into these games with a good plan and like an ability to adjust. And I thought like. The, the initial plan, I guess, was not so bad. Like like I said, they actually did, I think, try to throw the ball on Notre Dame. It just wasn't working very well. Um, and Notre Dame was like playing pretty deep and, and trying to limit that because they figured Ohio State was going to do the same thing. But like the adjustments after that just were not great. And they won the game, right? That's all that matters. I'm not I'm not saying like, yeah, but you didn't like you didn't do enough. Like you won in a game like this. Honestly, I don't I don't care how you win as long as you win in a game like this. But it's it's just like checking up on things that could become problems in future games if they're not addressed slash fixed. Last uh, list of rants that we'll run through. I've never been more embarrassed as a fan. Ryan has no idea what it means to be an Ohio State football coach. I was a defender till right this moment. I hope he gets canned at the end of the season. This is just unacceptable for three seasons. You can't figure this out. Gene Smith should be letting it rip on Ryan Day's job status. <laughs> Uh, let's see. And then, oh man, Ryan is angry. Wow. I like to see this. And then Doug overreacting and Bill being the voice of reason. You don't know how much I missed this the last three years. So they go from, uh, fire the coach to like, Hey, these guys are talking to each other in the post game show. All right. Quick break. When we come back, analyzing more football, no more rants next on the podcast daily. All right. Doug and Landis back. W what about this? Day has never had a good team without Urban's influence. Fact. Prove it wrong. Like that idea, it might even be from one of the rants. Do you mm -hmm. feel like there, there is some question? I, I, I think Ryan Day has sort of shed the Urban thing and established his version of this program on his own. D do, you, do you think there's any truth to someone saying something like that? No, I, I, if you want to say that his best team was the result of Urban's recruiting, I think that's fair. Like, I think everyone still probably thinks that 2019 was his best team. Um, but like they got to the playoff last year with a largely a team largely recruited by Ryan Day. Um, so I agree with you. I, I don't, I don't necessarily, I don't think that's true. Really, um, I do think this program has. Um, and probably in some people's minds, for better or worse, taken taken on most of Ryan Day's I identity, and and the roster clearly has. He's recruited. I think how many guys on the roster were recruited when everyone was still here? Like Josh Proctor and Matthew Jones. That's it, right? Mm, yeah. So, and it's one of those things too that like the some of the success at the end of Urban was was partially Ryan Day, right? That like he helped bring about sort of the yeah. quarterback receiver evolution at Ohio State. So, mm -hmm. um. There were also some, like, you know, there was a, a not insignificant defensive mess at the end of Urban's tenure that Ryan Day had to clean up to. Yeah, and I mean, again, it's one of those things that, um, you know, what Urban at his peak did at Ohio State, what Urban was able to do after they lost in 2014, the way that whole team rallied and came back, obviously goes in the history books. But, you know, I don't know that anyone's, are Ohio State fans clamoring for the 15, 16, 17, 18 Urban Meyer teams or Urban Meyer performances? So, you know, I, I don't I, I understand like the anger about that. And I and I don't think Ryan Day will ever escape it, but I, I don't I don't think it's true. Like Justin Fields, um, in 2020, right? That they they were far from a perfect team, but they made the national championship game, and that's pretty much a Ryan Day team. Right. If if yeah. Chase Young and Jeff Okuda and that kind of thing are leftovers from the urban era, like it, it was a lot of a lot of Ryan by 2020. So anyway, yep. if, I don't know. I don't know what people like. Do, do, do people just want woo, great win because it was a great win? Or do you do you want to litigate do people want to litigate some of the pieces of what's going on or, or like one of these things? You know, the anger that comes out, right? You're mad about a call. You're mad about something in your head. When your team is behind late in the game, it's almost like being drunk. And actually, mm. it also might be being drunk yeah. because it might go together. But it's like you're truthful. This is what you really think when the, when it's the chips are down. 
So we're getting some honesty in here, even though they won and had a great win that absolutely should be celebrated. And we'll get to a point about that in a second. But there are these things that are bubbling up inside of people. That's in there somewhere, right? And and yeah. sh should it be? I, I, it's like my eternal complex, I think, in analyzing Ohio State is like, can it ever be okay to just like, hey, celebrate a good win? Like I felt, I felt yeah. this after the Penn State game last year, which I think you've talked about, and Noah Austin has talked about too, was like. They won on the road in Happy Valley, man. Like they didn't play very well for three quarters of the game, but they figured out a way to win in Happy Valley against a decent Penn State team. I, I, can we all just like, hey, like have a good time and celebrate yeah. that and and take it for what it is? And it's like some people were definitely on the same wavelength with that, and some definitely were not. And and um, I think that is like the duality of this fan base a little bit, right? There, there are people who definitely just want to, you know, do the woo and celebrate uh, a win at Notre Dame and and bask in the misery of Notre Dame fans and make fun of people on Twitter, like own it and talk a little trash that that's all well and good. But there are definitely are people who are like, great, we won, but this, 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 and this are wrong. And it's going to come back to bite us in the butt. So you're trying to serve two masters there, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. It's definitely two kind of different ways to look at it. Uh, this is um, James who wanted this conversation. I really hope there's some admission of that being a good game between two good teams. I hope it's not, what happens sometimes when the Bucks pull out a close win and analysts go on and on about how it was a mediocre game by the Buckeyes and the competition was bad, just like they thought that the whole time. That's a darn good team that just won. That's a darn good team that just lost. And that's a win that's only going to look better and better all year for the Buckeyes. I just hope we don't get a bunch of, I told you they were meh. Um, so I, and then he like listened to the post game show and thought that we were doing that. I, I did not think we we're doing that at the post game show, but this is not about the post game show. He, James says he would have liked an answer to the question about good win against a good team. Uh, and so I do think that. I, wh what do you think of Notre Dame in the end? I think Notre Dame is like, is going to wind up being like a top 15 team. And I actually think Notre Dame has a chance to be a problem for USC. Because USC's defense is not very good, and I think Ohio State's defense is very good. And we'll get to it in, in a moment. There are things that Ohio State did to Sam Hartman. Mm -hmm. And so people who come out of this being like, Sam Hartman stinks, that is not correct. Mm -hmm. Ohio State, did a, I thought, did a, a great job at times with Sam Hartman. They're going to play Clemson. I don't know what Clemson's going to do to him. They're going to play USC. I don't know how that's going to go. I this very well could be a 10 and two Notre Dame team that winds up in the top 10 at the end of the year. So from that standpoint, I, I absolutely think and on the road that it's a good win against a good team. And I, I, I do think that that needs to be acknowledged. And I, I think it is being acknowledged by most of the Ohio state fans out there. Yeah, I, I think so. I think it's a good win against a good team. I, I think note like, I probably expressed more skepticism about Notre Dame than than you did, whether it was on Kings of Columbus or on Kings of the North. Um, I think part of that was like just sort of who they played and and not wanting to buy into to like how efficient and explosive they looked at times against the, against that caliber of team. Um, and I thought that maybe they were being kind of um, pumped up a little bit as something that they're they're quite not. But then I thought like they were pretty physical. They were more physical than I thought they would be. Um, they had um, better athletes on defense, I think, than I, than I gave them credit for. So I'm not like trying to retcon Ohio State's win. It's like, say, oh, oh, Notre Dame was good all along. But like, I guess what I'm saying is my impression of Notre Dame, I think, in the end was wrong. They are a little better than I thought they were. So um, I do think that was a good win against a good team. And also, too, like, it's not, I don't, I don't, I don't say like Ohio State didn't play its A game and still won as an insult. Like, that's, if Ohio State can not play its A game and beat a team like Notre Dame on the road, I think that's kind of encouraging, is it not? I think it is. Uh, this is Will from Colorado. Root cause analysis question. Who's at fault for our offensive, for our offense being lackluster? What presents quarterback, offensive line, playmakers, play calling? He he would love to get as deep as we can. And in this situation, we're not going to go super, super deep here, Landis. But I, I think my initial take is the run game is, is an issue for the opposite reason it was a year ago. Last year, the entire running back room was running back room was hurt, mm -hmm. and the guy with the ball in his hands often maybe wasn't taking advantage of what was there as they searched and searched and searched through a ridiculous 
rash of injuries in the running back room. Now, as we did talk about Trey post game, but I think like they have the guys, and now I think it's the offensive line. And I think yep. this version of the offensive line and run blocking. So it's it's the run game is still not to the Ohio State standard for two different reasons. But that I think both years, if you felt like the offense wasn't hitting on all cylinders, it's trying to rely on a run game that isn't reliable, I think is the root cause. I, th I think that's. I would probably give that the largest percentage po uh, amount of percentage points. I think it's offensive line. And I also think it's what they're being asked to do in the run game. Um, there were a couple of runs in that game where it was just like that. The block you're asking that offensive lineman to make, he cannot make. And it blows up the entire play. And there was some of that in the Indiana game. And I thought they got it fixed a little bit in, in the two games after that. And then some of it crept, crept back up against Notre Dame. So I think there's there's play calling at, at play there too. But it is mostly at the moment, I think, just an offensive line that is not um, fully formed yet. And what does the fully formed version of this line look like? How good could it be? I, I don't know that I have a good answer for that or a good projection for you. I just know that they're not there, and I think they can get better than they currently are. Um, but that was a pretty difficult test for that group, I think, in, in the end. And they did what they had to do. Um, in that game, but but I do think if you if you're asking why does Ohio State's offense not quite look like how it's looked in, in most games under Ryan Day, I do think offensive line play is a major major piece of that. I want to acknowledge Ezra who said post game, am I hopelessly pessimistic for not being won over by that performance? Bunch of questions, bunch of questions. I just watched the post game interview where he torched Lou Holt, and I take back everything I said. So another example. People of love that, that man. Yeah. I, so. Actually, we'll get to a survey about that when we come back on the podcast daily. All right, Doug and Landis, I, I want to get to a couple more survey things here. We're not going to stay forever on this episode, which we often do when I'm involved. Hmm. I kind of asked the same kind of questions about Ryan Day and Kyle McCord and kind of got different answers. So about so I asked, what are your thoughts on Ryan Day going after Lou Holtz for saying the Buckeyes weren't tough? These were the options. I loved it. That's my coach. Ohio against the world. Take that, Lou. Let's roll. I like seeing a real, real emotion from Day in any setting. It was fine, but I'm not sure about getting that fired up about an 86-year-old former coach. Or I didn't really like it. I thought Day was over the top. So loved it, liked it, fine, didn't like it, right? Mm -hmm. Kyle McCord. What most closely matches your thoughts on Kyle McCord right now? That's my QB. He's clutch, cold-blooded assassin. Let's roll. Impressed with the final drive for a young quarterback who is still improving. Just okay much of the game. Glad he did what was needed at the end. Or I still have real questions about him, right? So my point here is this. For Ryan Day, the most enthusiastic answer, one. I loved it. That's my coach. Ohio against the world got 56%. 25% liked it. 16% thought it was fine and 4% actually didn't like it. Okay. So I loved it versus I didn't like it is 56 to four Ohio state fans are all in on Ryan day going after Lou Holtz for Kyle McCord. The second most enthusiastic answer one impressed with the final drive for a young quarterback who's still improving got 73%. The that's my QB got 21%. Okay. 7% real questions about him. Nobody voted for that. Yeah. I was a little surprised there wasn't a little more. That's my QB because of course he's young. Of course he hasn't played much, but I thought maybe there would be more than 21% of the people Landis who were like, I don't need to see anymore. I'm in on him. As long as he's the guy in the moment, he showed it. He's only going to get better. That's my guy. Are you surprised? It's not more than 21%. Yeah. Because I read that as, cause I, I I'm sure I, like anyone who is wanting more to whatever degree that is like looks at 17 points and things like what's up. Um, but like those results to me, I read those as people putting that more like on McCord than they are on day. I, I, I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe that's unfair. Um, but I am surprised by that. I thought, I thought that the, the second most extreme good would be for Ryan would be the lead for Ryan yeah. and people would be all in on on kyle now kyle he did he was five of 13 <laughs> on, on the last drive so like he wasn't he wasn't ripping every throw and he did put a throw right in, in notre dame defenders hands yeah so like i think that response is actually probably correct and measured if you if you were to give an honest assessment of how he played in the two minute drill when he had the rip it man he ripped it that third and 19 ball to a mecca was awesome 
Um, yeah. But he almost threw two picks on the drive too. So, um, and that's fine. He's a young quarterback going through that for the first time. I don't, I don't say that as a criticism, but, but I'm sure that that's in people's minds when they don't go full blown. That's my quarterback. But it is, it is a little funny to me that it's like, what? So, so both Ryan Day and Kyle McCord, maybe during the post, although you noted how good he was on third down, excellent on awesome. third down the whole game, yep. right? Yep. But maybe like up until the final drive, I think people probably were questioning both the quarterback and the coach. And then the quarterback leads a game winning drive in his fourth career start. And the coach goes after an 86 year old <laughs> guy who showed up on Pat McAfee's show. And the Lou Holtz comments went over people more than the drive to win the game. Yeah. They people really like the Lou Holtz comments. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying, um, there were a lot of, I mean, again, multiple people who were still at, at the end of the game were like, I don't know, man. And then once Ryan Day stepped up to the mic, and as everybody heard, Jerry Emig, the great Ohio State sports information director, right as Ryan Day is coming on the air, says, take a breath. And Ryan Day says, yeah, watch this. And then, <laughs> boom, right at Lou. So, uh, okay, let's do this. Did you note this? This is Isaac. That last defensive stand, they tapped into something flipping JT and Jack. Did they do something with them on opposite sides or anything there? I, I did not note that. I saw that question as well. Maybe, maybe you want to go back and actually watch those plays, but I haven't done it yet. Um, so, But JT was on the le the right side of the offensive line on those plays. So he, I JT guess was up against Alt almost the entire game. Yes. and then So if he was flipped to the right tackle at the end, then that did feel that would be new to me. Definitely on the screenplay because that play was to the right of the formation yep. for Notre Dame. Um, so that play for sure. I can't remember the play, but I think the play before it, he might have been too. Okay. That maybe is something there. Because I do think, you know, JT, I think Joe Walt, according to PFF, allowed three pressures. One of them mm -hmm. has to be when Tyleek Williams shoved him into Sam Hartman. Yeah. But I think the other two would have been on JT. Like that's more than Joe Walt usually gives up. But I do think like Joe Walt won that matchup. And then JT on the opposite side makes a game changing play by knocking down that screen but again he's against the right tackle so maybe that was a good adjustment by ohio state yeah that screenplay was was blocked up pretty good if that if that ball would have gotten into the hands of the running back and i'm not i'm not sure who it was um i think that thing was getting out and it might have been curtains <laughs> if, if jt didn't do what he did there so let's use this opportunity now to talk a little bit about the defenders who played and checking the pff snaps there were basically nine ohio state defenders who played the entire game or close to the entire game. That's Tyleek Williams, JT Tuimaloao, Jack Sawyer on the defensive line, Steel Chambers and Tommy Eichenberg at linebacker, Davis and Igbignosen and Denzel Burke at corner, and Lathan Ransom and Josh Proctor at safety. The only place where like there really was any kind of rotation is Mike Hall and Ty Hamilton kind of split the other tackle spot. Hall played 35, Hamilton played 34. And then they they moved in and out depending on the situation the nickel safety or nickel corner spot it's either sunny styles who played 44 snaps or jordan hancock who played 21 so they had 65 defensive snaps cody simon played 15 defensive snaps a couple of them i think was a third linebacker a couple of them were in place of steel chambers steel was 10 snaps shy of the whole game but again it's mo like mostly leaning on guys and literally these guys played the entire game every single snap Lathan Ransom, not a surprise. Josh Proctor, not a surprise. Tommy Eichenberg, not a surprise. And JT and Jack Sawyer each played the entire game, which, given the history of Larry Johnson and the defensive line rotation at Ohio State, is mind-boggling. It's a little shocking. Yeah. I um, It's a big talking point, right, at Big Ten Media Days when Ryan Day said he wants to play his best defensive lineman more, which... I, I don't think on a surface is is a terrible idea. I, I worry that there's been an overcorrection there. Knowing knowing now how much that both that those guys played the entire game and that Tyleek Williams basically didn't come off the field either. And it's not like they just need a rest, man. It's a tough position to play. Like they get pummeled on every snap. They need to come off the field a little bit. I think I think the best programs, the best defensive lines in the country are able to spell their top guys a little bit so that they're freshest for the big moments. And I did think that Ohio State's defensive line was getting worn down a little bit in the second half of that game. And I think it's a byproduct of playing so much. 
it almost is now at the point where it feels like to me that Larry Johnson's heard the questions so much. He's like, oh, you, oh, you, 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 you want the best guys to play more, do you? Mm. How's, how's every snap? Is that more enough? It, like, it's such a swing. Kenyatta Jackson did not play. Yeah. Caden Curry, I think, played one snap. I think they have they have guys. It's not like they don't have a third and fourth defensive end that would be capable. I get it if it's more of a run heavy game and you're not sure about Kenyatta Jackson, but zero. I am I am dumbfounded by these numbers. And and I and I'll use this opportunity too to talk about I, I want to talk about this. What Jim Knowles did, I thought. We talked about in the post game where they play in a lot of zone. I thought actually watching it in the first half, they mixed man and zone almost snap to snap. And Sam Hartman didn't know what he was seeing. I thought the th like the last three drives of the first half, there were moments when on second down, I think he thought he was getting man. They run motion. They think they're going to, you know, free a guy up. And all of a sudden it's zone and there's guys sitting in spots. Then they have a play where they drop eight on a third down. It might be a, a matchup zone because I think he thinks his receiver is going to sit down in an open area and Josh Proctor is sitting in that area. Yeah. Josh, that's like teaching tape. The the play Josh Proctor made, because that is zone, right? You know what play mm -hmm. I'm talking about. Yep. And he is all over the guy. It is a perfect play by Josh Proctor, but Sam Hartman, I don't think, thought it was going to be that. There's a play on third down where Jordan Hancock's in coverage and he just like airmails a dude because I don't think he knew what he was going to see. I thought you said it after the game, echoing what Jim Knowles had said. It's not about aggression. It's about unpredictability. I thought the unpredictability of the defense, zone and man, play to play, not knowing what was coming, three-man rushes, draw, you know, they'd have three guys in a route and six defenders. Again, I made a big deal in the moment about Cody Simon's coverage on the fourth and one, where then Cody came up and, and made the tackle on Sam Hartman. Mm -hmm. On that play, they have two tight ends leaking out. There's two Buckeyes running, which each of those two tight ends. Steel Chambers and Lathan Ransom have one, and Josh Proctor and Sonny Styles have one. There's nothing there. It is a perfect call and perfect execution by the defense. When this defense wasn't tired in the first half, I thought plan and execution was an A+. Plus. And then I thought they got tired. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's what it is too. There were a couple like third down conversions against like soft zone coverage that I think pe people were were asking about. Um, but, like I'm okay with that. There I, were a couple like matchups in that zone where they're hitting some stuff underneath, but it's because they're not letting anything over the top. You got to yeah, do something sometimes, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Like, do you? There were times where I felt like Jim Knowles maybe could have trusted his guys to play a little bit of man there, but but. I think Notre Dame is hoping for that too, right? They want that to try to get some of those big shots. And and I think that by and large, Jim Knowles was, I don't want to call it guessing right, but he was just sort of on the correct wavelength and 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 calling the right coverages for the moment most of the time. And and at least in a way to eliminate explosive plays. Um, so I'm with you. Like I don't, I I, I don't it's the reason I said after like during the postgame show that I, I didn't come away with like lingering concerns so much about Ohio State's defense, other than like I think they could use another tackle to emerge to play a little bit more to help Ty Leak and, and Mike Hall and Ty Hamilton um, and whatever needs to happen for them to trust Kenyatta Jackson and Caden Curry a little more too. Like I, I think is almost paramount as you like gear up for the Penn state and, and Michigan games. I just, I, or, or play them now so you can give the other, the starters a little bit of a, of a respite so that they're not playing 60 snacks, a game, snaps a game, excuse me, leading up to that. Like that feels a little problematic to me. I, I do like, I'm now like suddenly worried about that. Um, but other than like in terms of the plan and execution of it, I thought it was actually quite good. Uh, from Lawrence, Kyle McCool, which is mm -hmm. the first I'd heard of that. Have you heard Kyle McCool from anybody else? No, no, that's good. I like it. That's yeah. good. I think I, I told Lawrence he can probably copyright that because I think yeah. he's in early on that one. People didn't like uh, the NBC coverage. This is from Josh. I thought NBC's oh. coverage of the game was really poor in what only could be described as a direct shot at Bill. Noah Eagle called our punter <laughs> micro and even had yeah. a bad joke prepared to go along with it. Their analysis of the, uh, the Marv catch non catch was lacking in the moment until they got better later. They go to commercial on every replay, and sometimes they didn't make it back in time for the ref's announcement. The list goes on. I, I, again, it was weird. It, again, it's so weird what NBC did because it's an, it's a Notre Dame home game. They have a Notre Dame crew, 
the Notre Dame crew. It's Jack Collinsworth, J A C Jack, not Jace. It's a hard C with no K after it. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I believe so. I've actually now I don't know if I've ever seen it spelled out, but I've heard he's Kalis. I think he's definitely yeah. Kalis. So they did Maryland, Michigan State. They like dumped the Notre Dame crew on Maryland, Michigan State. And Jason Garrett was like, I don't know who any of these people are, but thank <laughs> goodness that we didn't get that crew. Here, there's not any gravitas yet. Now, you people know Todd Blackledge, they're used to that voice. This is one of those things. I think a lot of Ohio State fans, and they've expressed this over the years, are tired of ESPN and glad to get away from ESPN. People are now used to Gus Johnson and Joel Klatt. But man, as much as it aggravated Ohio State fans at times, when Fallon and Herbie showed up, you knew it was on. And I think people are going to yeah. miss that for a little bit because Noah Eagle is young. He just hasn't been around. And I didn't think there was a lot of gravitas to that game. And, and I'm not blaming anybody, but... I agree that sort of like it wasn't up to the standard that Ohio State fans are accustomed to when it comes to big games. I think that's right, but I, I think that's mostly a familiarity thing. I, I, I agree with the explanations of some of the penalty things. Like it was just not clear on television or probably in the stadium what exactly was going on with some of those reviews. Um, and that's on the officiating crew as well. It's not merely on on, on the broadcasters. Um I thought it was lacking a, a little bit. The Je I definitely noted the Jesse Micro thing. I thought that was like, what are you? It's not even his name, dude. <laughs> I guess he just was wrote he making a joke. I don't even understand what what's happening with that. Yeah, guy. he said like, here comes Ohio State punter Jesse Micro, uh, but don't let that fool you, folks. He's uh, six foot four and two hundred and twenty pounds. That's not a joke. Yeah. I, I'm not, I, I make horrible dad jokes every day in real life on Twitter to my family, to tech subscribers. I, I give that a thumbs down. Okay, they'll get better, but it's okay to be mad. But also, like, what do you want? You want ESPN back? I think a lot of state fans, Ohio State fans would say no. Um, mm. Run fits for the linebackers. Watching the game back, our linebackers were not good. They were missing run fits, running into blockers instead of filling. Not what I expected. That's from Aiden. Um, their, their PFF grades are really bad. For that game, for Steele and Tommy, yeah. Did you did you agree with that? I, I guess you watch mostly offense still, right? Well, I felt yeah. I haven't I haven't rewatched really the defense yet, but I definitely felt that a time or two watching it live. I, I might even made mention of it. Yeah, you in did. Slack. Yep. Um, I can't remember if I said like they're getting covered up or they're getting caught in the wash a little bit, but it did feel like there were a few runs that got out interior runs because someone was not in the gap they were supposed to be in, and I'm assuming it was a linebacker. It could be a tackle. Sometimes the tackles will like do a swim move and maybe jump over a gap when they're not supposed to. I think that happens too. Um, they could have been more gap sound on a few of, of the second down runs. Um, it did feel like in some of those instances, they were perhaps selling out a little bit to try to put Notre Dame behind the sticks and it wasn't quite working. All right, last quick break. Then we'll wrap it up here on the podcast daily. All right, Landis, a couple last points. There's a comparison that I think we want to get out of here on that I think might be a good one. This is from Kendall. No one is talking about how poorly Marcus Freeman coached the last three minutes. If you're going to pass on second down, pass on third down, play to win the game, or run twice and Ohio State has no timeouts left. Then he took a delay of game on the punt, using all his timeouts so he didn't have one at the end, and then they played the last two plays with 10 players, and Marcus Freeman tried to explain this, that sort of like he didn't want to give Ohio State an opportunity to reset by trying to maybe like take a penalty and have the 11th player get on the field. And I do think there is some, I don't know if it's irony. It's like Ohio State's toughness won the game, but they also ran over the gap where the where the missing Notre Dame player was. Yeah. Like, it's like, where? Oh, did you notice that they only had 10 players? It's like, well, they only have three guys on the line. And then Chip Trainum landed where the other Notre Dame defensive linemen should have been. I did think Marcus's explanation of it was odd because like, if you end up taking a penalty there and sub... I mean, you move the ball half an inch. It's on right. the goal line, right? And the idea that, like, well, Ohio State's so scattered, I don't want them to get a chance to reset. Whatever that is, I'd rather have 11 players. Because <laughs> yeah. there's no more scattered that you can be than not having the allowable number of players on the field. Right. And they did it. It was the, the last two plays. It wasn't just the last yes, play. The last so two, they right. did it in the second play, like, out of a timeout. <laughs> 
<laughs> I only had 10 guys on the field. That explanation made no sense to me. Um, taking the delay of game on the punt also, like in the moment, I didn't think like, oh, that's odd. But then like, I think someone texted us, like, you think those five yards mattered? Like, yeah, right. <laughs> they definitely did. Um, so it was, it was, um, I don't know what that was. Was that like Marcus Freeman blinking? Like, maybe, maybe that's how I would, what I would call it. Well, I, I don't even know if it's blinking. I just think it's like a young coach who has not been in that situation very much doing a poor job. I, I don't think like, yeah, I don't think like, oh, he got, he got nervous. I think like he just made a poor decision in the moment because he hasn't been in a lot of those moments. And it feels like to me, somebody asked, and the text that I didn't grab it, and we just still can't grab everything about like why does experience matter? Like, why do you even oh, talk about experience? Yeah. Isn't it about mm -hmm. skill? And I was sort of like, well, doesn't experience matter in everything? And they were talking about it from a quarterback standpoint. And and in the end, if it's like, would you rather have somebody experienced and less skilled or more skilled and less experienced? And like, if you want to have that discussion, I think it's an interesting discussion. The idea of experience doesn't matter. I don't. I don't think is right. I mean, I think experience I'm, I'm better. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm better than I used to be at this <laughs> after doing this for eight years. I just think that applies in sports. I, I find it an odd, an odd view to think that like experience doesn't matter. Cause to me, this is going to be one of those, if Marcus Freeman is the head coach at Notre Dame for 40 years, he's going to be at like the South Bend touchdown club saying, you know, back in my second year, I only had 10 guys on the field at the end of a game that we lost to Ohio State, not on one play, but two. Yeah. I don't know why we'd have a Southern accent. I just think that all old coaches kind of acquire a Southern accent because, like, it's a funny story in retrospect, but, like, in the moment as you're learning it, it stinks. It's a huge mistake. Yeah, I, I saw that question, too. I did I did think it was an interesting point. And and you, the way you catch it, I think, is the discussion, right? Would you rather have more skill, less experience, or um, – more experience, less skill. I think I would rather have. I would rather have more skill. I think than experience. Um, if it were if it were presented that way, but the experience matters for sure. Um, now it doesn't. It's not a blanket statement, right? Doesn't doesn't automatically mean you are suddenly at a disadvantage if you are inexperienced. I think Kyle McCord proved that, right? He he executed that two minute drill as an inexperienced quarterback. But going into the game, if you thought that that Sam Hartman is a six year guy and Kyle McCord as a first year starter basically were equally skilled because of work mostly because of where Kyle is in his development, then I think you'd rather have the experience, right? You wouldn't say that after the fact, but going into it, I think that's a reasonable take. All right. Last couple survey things and then we'll get to our final question. I asked I just asked the texters how you feeling when you woke up on Sunday morning in terms of joy, excitement, being fired up. Scale of one to ten, one is low, ten is high. They're an eight point seven five, so they're feeling good. How do you feel about this Ohio State win? I, I, a very three very stark answers. It's awesome. It's a huge win. It'll give them confidence and propel them to great things. I'll take it. It's I'm just enjoying an exciting, memorable victory. I'm not sure what it means. But like, I'm just going to savor it for what it is. Or I'm worried. Like, they barely survived, and there are tougher games ahead, and they have things they need to improve on. 46% awesome. 44% I'll just take it. I don't know what it means. I'll take it. 10% worried. So that's five times as much awesome to worried. But that's, a, that's almost half of like, I don't know, man. Just give me a win in a game like that, which I think is a very reasonable reaction, is it not? Yeah, I think I think that I, I would hope that that is most people's reaction. So I'm glad glad to hear that. It doesn't. It it's the thing I both like the most and like the least about college football is that every game has to be a referendum on something, um, and it's a small sample size sport. And maybe that's changing in the world of the 12 team playoff. And and I think for everyone's like <laughs> mental health, that's probably a good thing. Um, so if everyone or if most people are like, give me the dub. We'll worry about what's what needs to be worried about later, and and if you never step beyond that, and you're just like juice that your team won, you don't care about what's to come later. I think that's great too. Last couple things: uh, How does this rank among Ohio State victories in your time as a fan? It's one of uh, it's the most exciting, best win I can remember. Two percent. It's one of the five or so best, most exciting wins I can remember. Seventy one percent. It's good, but not quite an all timer. Twenty seven percent. So that's like. A yeah. lot of people who were like, that was one for the history books. And, and I think that's probably appropriate. People are going to remember this one. 
Uh, what do you think Ohio State's regular season record will be? I asked 12 and 0, 11 and 1, or 10 and 2 or worse. What do you think won, Landis? 11 and 1. Correct. 61% 11 and 1, 30% 12 and 0, 9% 10 or 2 or worse, which if you're voting 11 and 1, you just think they're going to lose to Michigan or Penn State. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think anyone thinks they're going to go to Wisconsin and lose at this point. Toughness discussion. This is something that I always bang the drum on whenever it comes up. Which is closer to your thoughts in the Ohio State toughness discussion that led Ryan Day to his Lou Holtz rant? The entire toughness discussion is bad for them. They should ignore it and just throw to win. That's 36%. The entire toughness discussion is meaningless. I'm tired of it. Just play. 31%. They need to be tougher. And I want Day and the team to keep hammering toughness as a necessity. 18%. Ohio State is tough, and anyone who thinks they aren't can cram it. 15%. So if you combine the they are tough or they need to be tough, that's 33%, and then you're basically a third, a third, a third. It's bad. It's meaningless. It's necessary. Split three ways. I guess I'm not surprised by that, but it is one of those things I think. So there's some portion of the people who find it meaningless or bad for them who still like Ryan Day bringing it up. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, I think it's a thing like you want them to be tough, right? But uh, I I think at a certain point, you talk about it so much that I I do think it becomes a bad thing for them or or it sticks in their head in the wrong way and invites bad habits or poor decision-making to prove a point. And I think that's what people are still probably a little worried about. And that, that I don't know. I, I honestly rewatching the game. I, I I'm not a hundred percent convinced that that crept up throughout the majority of this game. Um, it crept up a couple times though, a couple crucial moments. And, and I think Ohio state would be better off not, act, not operating that way. All right. Last one from Tyler, who I thought made an interesting comparison. Has the comparison been made to the 2014 Penn state game? The vibes after that win in Happy Valley. I'm not saying we are winning the Natty, but it feels like a similar win in a lot of ways. So Urban Meyer, right? If you're asking Urban Meyer, great wins in Ohio State history, he's going to put that one up there, right? This is mm-hmm. this is double overtime, Joey, an exhausted Joey Bosa saving the game, right? This is JT Barrett toughing it out. That was a Penn State team that had lost its previous two games, including one to Northwestern. It was unranked four and two coming in. Penn state went on to be seven and six that year and two and six in the big 10. And they gave everything they could to Ohio state in double overtime An exhausted Ohio state exerted everything to win that game. And did what did Penn state wind up being a great team? No. Were they a great opponent that night? They were. They absolutely were at home in their place. And I don't know. I I can't remember, but was anybody like, I don't know, double overtime against Penn State. They lost to Northwestern. What are we doing? Like, I know Urban Meyer wasn't because Urban Meyer's like, that's what it is to be a man. So I, I think it is potentially a very interesting comparison. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think it is because I I think you. I'm just looking at 2014 now. Like they they weren't necessarily off and running after after that game. Um, they played a weird one with Minnesota in the snow that was closer than people probably expected it to be. Um, otherwise they were kind of rolling. <laughs> Most of their other games got the big one at Michigan State. Um, but I think it means something to like play a team that's given you everything they can in their place in a tough environment and finding a way to win regardless of what it looks like. And I think that is a valuable experience for a team. Honestly, it's a valuable experience for a team win or lose, but you'd you'd love to be the team that that wins in that scenario. Um, And it can build to something later in the year. So if people want to grab on to that idea, I think that's great. I think you should. We don't know where this is going to go. You might as well. And I do think in the end, a program like Penn State that year, a program like Notre Dame this year, they have some talent. They recruit some talent. It's not the same. Whatever their record is, whatever they finish up as, it's just not the same as playing Minnesota or Indiana or Purdue. It's not. 
and there's yeah. some winning DNA in the program. So they're not like maybe scared in the moment, like some other, you know, Maryland just doesn't know what it's like if, when you really get down to the wire against Ohio State in a game like that. Not that Penn State's won a lot of those games, but they're not afraid of it. Marcus Freeman's a young coach, but I don't think Notre Dame was afraid of it, even though they probably could have been a little more aggressive with the play calling. So I think that does matter. You beat a quality opponent at their place, and you found a way to do it, whatever that was. Okay. Yeah. We'll wrap up the podcast daily landis take it from here what we're, we're taking the week off is that right on the feed we're done we'll see everybody next monday since Cer- they're off this week certainly not the uh the the media coverage schedule changes mm-hmm. this week no uh <clears throat> no ryan day press conference on tuesday hoping to get some interviews wednesday night so if we do we'll have i think our normal snap judgments there um but yeah we're still we're still you know we're here every day uh later on monday we'll have the rooster show uh that should be up in the afternoon the the one change this week um is that kings of the north which is typically on monday we're going to run that on tuesday uh because doug and i wanted to do this and then we need more time to get ready for that so that's going to run tuesday we'll still have kings of columbus later in the week um dailies every day i'm sure berm will chime in with the bermanology there'll be a buck iq later this week with austin and, and zach Bourne. i'm assuming and uh, I guess we'll have to talk. We're going to do a betting show this week, Doug. I don't know. We're so bad. I I, I don't know. I'm awful. I want over again. So if we're not yeah. going to do one, that's we, fine. We have no me. feel. Maybe we can do a betting show since we're not talking about Ohio State because we have no feel for this team. We have yeah, no man. idea what this team is going to do week to week. So I don't know. Maybe we need to give everybody a week off to like keep their money in their pockets, including ourselves. Or, um, or are we going to give way, the people an opportunity to fade us because we can't? We don't want to deny them that. I hope. I mean, is that actually a way to get people to listen to your show? <laughs> We're terrible at this. Do the opposite. Just save your money and subscribe to the tech six one four six six two four five zero nine. Two week free trial, six bucks, uh, six bucks a month after that. All right, Landis, thanks for letting me on the daily, man. Yeah, yeah, of course. This was you've been on the daily before. This is not your not your first radio. Uh, I don't know. I Berm and I have not decided if we're going to do the the rewatch. I'm sure we will. People like that. We like doing it. So maybe a more thorough, full rewatch pod because I think people are still going to be wanting to talk about this game because there's no other there's no game coming up on Saturday. Might as well talk about a big one for Ohio State that I think people are going to remember and enjoy uh, for quite some time. But until then, uh, for Doug, I am Bill. That was the podcast daily for Monday. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you later.